e- but, I mean, even if we're only talking to 12 people that's great that's fine <laughs> exactly did you manage to get any events out before ah oh, we're live we are live on facebook natasha so. live. how exciting so thank you very much for coming along this evening to our latest author event um virtually from exeter library although it's not actually from exeter library um natasha pulley has come along this evening to talk to us um and we are also screening to three other libraries um across the county tonight which are barnstable South Moulton and Newton Abbott. So hello to everybody watching from there. Um, Natasha has written three books, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, The Bedlam Stacks, and her latest one is The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow. Um, The Watchmaker was really successful, um, award-winning and a bestseller. Um, Were you, because that was your first or your debut novel, was that a surprise for you? yeah it was a it was a huge surprise partly because when you're a debut and you're just starting out you don't know what normal is so my agent would be telling me sales figures and my editor would be going yes that's good but people in publishing are really nice so you never know (laughs) someone's just lying to you and I went all through the release of the watchmaker hardback and even the first few months of the paperback being absolutely sure that people were just lying to me and being polite um and I didn't really understand how successful the first book was until the second one just like did normally and I went oh they weren't lying that's actually okay (laughs) that must be really I mean it must I I guess it's nice that people in publishing are nice because it wouldn't be it would be awful if people were saying well there that's really bad but I mean the cover of the book is um extraordinary isn't it It is it's beautiful oh actually all of the books that covers of your books are beautiful um and as someone who does choose book by its cover I'm I am um, definitely. Oh, I urge you to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what inspired you to write the sequel, which is the lost future of Pepper Harrow? What What inspired you to carry on the story? Yeah. Um. So, when I wrote Watchmaker, there had always been a continuation of the story, but then I convinced myself that it was rubbish, um, and I didn't do anything about it, which is why, which is why book two wasn't related to book one. Um, but then my editor said, you know, you, did you not mention to me that you had two chapters of a sequel somewhere? And I went, yeah, but they're really terrible. And she went, give them to me now, um, which was sinister and frightening. <laughs> um, but I did. Um, and I think as soon as I would started working on it again, I realised that there was actually a story there. And it was peculiarly difficult to get back into because you if you write what you think is a standalone novel, you leave those characters behind in your head and you assume you're not coming back to them. And in some ways you sort of allow yourself to move on. And it's, it's like um, if a set of your friends disappear off to New Zealand, you just assume you'll never see them again. <laughs> um, and so that's what it felt like with the characters from the first book and to try and get to know them again, especially in a narrative that was set five years later, it was really weird and I really struggled. But after struggling, an awful lot and after kind of drafts and drafts of being terrible it did I think it may have come together now <laughs> I've, I've I must admit I haven't read all of it but what I have read is um I'm really really enjoying and I I had I came late to the watchmaker as well so I've loved getting to know Faneuil and um I can't even remember the name now. It's got it from. It's Maury. Is Maury, it, that's it. Yes, yeah, it, Pete Maury, yeah. I completely understand. Actually, one of the things that we always talk about, but both, you know, my agent and my editors, I have two editors now, um, is how on earth can you expect people to remember names that are from a language that is completely unrelated to English? And actually loads of people have problems with it. And that's yeah. one of the reasons that all the way through the books, people say things that rhyme in English with their names so that you know how to say them. <laughs> so it's Kate and Maury. Kate and Maury, yeah. 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 Well, I, I really enjoyed um, getting to know the characters and I really liked Grace, the, the sort of introduction of Grace into it as well and her story. And it took me down a completely different path than I thought it was going. So I really <laughs> like that in a book. So I'm not going to give that away if you haven't read it, because okay. <laughs> that would be, would be awful, wouldn't it? That was a huge spoiler. But um, yeah, no, I, I really loved that. Um, if you, um, to people who haven't read The Watchmaker, would you like to sort of give an overview of maybe both of the books so that people know what they're about 
Yeah, of course. Um, so the watchmaker of Filigree Street is about a Japanese watchmaker who can remember the future. Um, and he lives in London in 1884. And this is when Clan Nagale, who are the, the kind of the Fenian grandfather group of modern IRA, um, are starting to bomb Whitehall. And one day, a young clerk who works um, at the home office as a telegraphist finds in his room a watch whose case won't open and it won't open and it won't open and he has no idea who left it there and he finds it actually quite sinister that someone broke into his uh, flat but then on the day that the terrorist group have said that a lot of bombs are going to go off it opens and it starts ticking and it's clearly counting down and after various events, which I will not talk about in case they get it all the way, <laughs> the watch does save his life and he decides that he needs to go and find this watchmaker um, because he believes that the watchmaker is something to do with the bombs. He thinks the watchmaker might be the bomb maker. And it's about how they meet, what they think of each other and why the watchmaker has saved him. So yeah. that's the watchmaker of Filigree Street. The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow picks up with the same characters five years after the watchmaker of filigree street finishes um they're very uh, they they still live together everything seems to be okay until the clerk who is now much more successful works at the foreign office as a translator between english and japanese his name is daniel he starts to get ill and it's really ill and the doctor says you need to get out of London now or you will die in the next fog season. And remember the fog season in this mm. period was proper pea soupers. Like the fog isn't white, it's brown. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> um, and it killed a lot of people. So he's told he really needs to get out. Fortuitously, interesting things are afoot in Tokyo. And he takes a posting at the British legation in Tokyo. The watchmaker comes too, but promptly disappears. And the lost future of Pepper Harrow is about what has happened to him and Daniel's search for him. Great. I think the, like I say, I really like the dynamics in the watchmaker between Grace and Maury and Daniel. Um, is that there's a similar sort of relationships going on? Because I saw this Peter in, is it Peter? Uh, in Piotr Kuznetsov in the story yeah. of the lost future of Pepper yeah. Harrow. Yeah. Um, so there will absolutely be a, quite a similar dynamic in The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow in that we have two guys and a girl and there's a uh, rivalry here. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say between who. Um, but it's a similar structure, but it's kind of inverted from the structure of Watchmaker. So I, I literally just pulled the same trick twice, but turned upside down. And you will absolutely see what I mean as you continue reading. <laughs> I will. No, I really enjoyed it. Um, you you're quite well traveled aren't you you've been to you went to japan um on a scholarship um to the daiwa i don't know how you pronounce it because it's obvious. yeah the daiwa foundation yeah, it's so, uh, funded by them. yeah <laughs> so um did that influence did that influence you largely in your writing so i'd actually written watchmaker before i went to japan and it had been bought by the by the publisher but not published yet so I was editing it while I was in Japan. And actually that was the most useful stage because it's a historical novel. So obviously, you know, lots of research involved have done on my reading. But what I found once I went to Tokyo was that some of the things I'd written in, particularly to Mori's character, I think were things that I had envisaged as like things that are really peculiar to him. He would, I had him in mind as like a very strange um, eccentric person only to realize that half the traits that I'd given him are actually traits common to all foreigners in any country that is very different to their own and I found myself turning into him very 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 quickly like if you I mean like if you were to move now to Tokyo you would definitely find yourself doing all the things that Kate Mori does when <laughs> from Tokyo to London like you care suddenly and really ferociously about the kind of tea you're drinking you care an awful lot if somebody uses a word that's slightly too complicated slightly too early in the morning like you start to really resent this linguistically and I can remember like feeling the most powerful hatred toward my language teacher it was about like nine o'clock in the morning so it wasn't uh, like a horrible time but it was too early anyway and she's she's teaching us words like um 
Samukaku no kata, which means it wasn't very cold, but Japanese <laughs> adjectives decline into past tense. And you just, you get very annoyed. And these are all the things that annoy Mori. And so what I found really quickly is that what seems very eccentric to somebody if they're from a place is actually completely just standard human behavior and it really changed the way that i wrote maury because it made him less weird less other um less eccentric a lot more normal and a lot more human and a lot more accessible and i think it was it became a much better book once i was in tokyo i think because i was i wasn't i wasn't trying to exoticize anyone which i really had in the first draft and i wasn't trying to other anyone or make anyone seem strange it was a process of kind of making this normal and looking back I, I was really horrified at the way I'd written the first draft yeah I guess it's difficult isn't it and I guess that sort of you know you were lucky in that way that you you had that experience to be able to because I imagine that a lot of people who you know in all sorts of walks of life of writing don't get the don't often get the experience to be able to travel to the country they're writing about I mean some some authors do but I imagine particularly with sort of early debut writers that that's not always on the cards um not because you just never have any money um, no. <laughs> I was really lucky I would never have been able to do that I mean, it was fully funded for 19 months so I came away with like not fluent Japanese because that would be really difficult but like yeah. quite good yeah um like, and enough for my sense of normal to be Japanese more than British at that point so that was really useful and then I saw, um, so going on to your second book, The Bedlam Stacks, um, that's set in Peru, am I right? Yep. yep. Um, and, and also you managed to, to have another trip to Peru. Um, was that before? Was that sort of because of, or did you sort of plan to write The Bedlam Stacks and then think, I need to go to Peru? Or Yeah, it was the third one. It, it was because of. Yeah. Um, so again, I'd, I'd written a draft of the book, but then realised that I really couldn't write about this with any kind of ownership or authority if I didn't like, you know, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, the great thing is that Spanish is not like Japanese. You can you can learn it in like three months if you're coming at it from English, because obviously English and Spanish are really closely related languages. So you're not like struggling for every single word. Um, so I went to Lima and I lived in Lima for two months and then learned Spanish in yeah I guess about two and a half months and then I went traveling I did part of the route that the exhibition did sorry the expedition did in the book um, and I like chased people around being really annoying like there's two <laughs> languages in Peru there's there's Spanish which everyone speaks but it's like kind of posh and there's Quechua which is the indigenous language which is which is what you speak if you're like more working class and I would chase after Quechua people saying things like, tell me about the Quechua notion of time. <laughs> and they'd call me a moron, but they would tell me. And it was really <laughs> That amazing. That was, yeah, but I mean, that was not, I didn't get a scholarship to do that. I, that, that I did off my, on my own dime. But then came back to find that the Society of Authors had given me a grant while I was away. Oh, <laughs> it. Yeah. Oh, it, it wasn't the other way around. You didn't get the no, grant. No, I, I went, I went, oh God, I've got no funding and lived like a church mouse. <laughs> and I came back to find that they'd given me the funding, which is really great. Um, I've got a question from, Hon um, I was going to say actually, um, to anybody who's watching the stream, you can ask questions on Facebook live um, if you're watching on any of the other streams you can um, access the questions via the exeter stream or you can message us via facebook messenger um, i've got a question from linda at honiton library and says do you tidy like marie kondo no <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> i don't know and oh, she wants to know also how many languages do you speak um so languages that i speak like to actually talk into like well <laughs> three English Japanese and Spanish and um, my Japanese is getting pretty shit now because I haven't I haven't used it very much but I still understand if someone's talking to me yeah Spanish it's still it's still okay because it's much closer and you can access Spanish TV in in English which is which is really great like you can watch things in Spanish on Netflix which is amazing whereas Japanese is much harder to get hold of um and I'm learning Russian wow I'm glad it but it's um bit harder than Spanish but it's not as hard as Japanese so we'll be all right. <laughs> we have um, language cafes um, at Exeter Library so we've been we have them sort of in, in real life when we don't have lockdown but um, yeah. we have them um, we're having them virtually at the moment we don't have a Japanese one we have a German a Spanish 
an Italian and hope to have a Russian one soon. So maybe you can join into that one. <laughs> when oh you're God, yeah, I mean, I want to I want to get to Moscow. Um, I want to get to Cairo as well. Um, so as soon as the lockdown lifts, I will not be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a, a plan for book four? Is that going? Have you got any plans? You said you said Cairo and Russia. So uh... plan, my darling. It's written and it's oh, being really? edited right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so book four should be out in may next year um so the copy edit should come back to me this week or next week and then it goes through proofread and then that's it it gets it gets oh. proofs get printed yeah um Can you say anything proofread. about it mm, yeah it's called the kingdoms and it is a complete departure from anything i've written before it is alternate history and it's about a a man called joe who has as far as he understands, completely lost his memory. And he struggles and struggles, and he becomes eventually um, a lighthouse keeper in 1901, only to find that he is kidnapped from the lighthouse by a man who he realises is clearly from the Napoleonic Wars 100 years before. And it, the book is about what might have happened in England if we had lost the Battle of Trafalgar. Oh, wow. It's, it's, really... it's going to be a bit different. No, it sounds really interesting. Think, yeah, well, I hope so. But I'm really, really, like, egotistically proud of this one. So I really need this one to do well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, hopefully you'll be able to come back and tell us about it next oh, month. Yeah, I hope so. That would be good. It would be really nice to come back and tell you about it in person, wouldn't it? It would be great. Yeah, so I've got a couple more questions. So Kaz has just said a fourth book, yay. Um, and Wayne says, who are your literary heroes? Hmm. So top of the list is always, oh, this is really conservative, but Arthur Conan Doyle. Ah, uh, well, that's a good, good choice. Ah, but I just really love the Sherlock Holmes stories. And actually the watchmaker of Filigree Street was a sort of a response to Sherlock Holmes because I loved that dynamic between Holmes and Watson. But what I always felt was really unrealistic was that Watson's wife never was in direct conflict with Holmes. Like she gives him a harsh word sometimes, but she never fights even though our husband's in danger and even though Holmes is putting him in danger. Um, and one of the things that kind of set me off in Watchmaker was, well, what if the wife fights? So that's what Grace does. Um, does. So yes, Arthur Conan Doyle is really important. Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman, all the way, all the way. <laughs> um, I just, I, I want to start using footnotes in my fiction in the way that Terry <laughs> Pratchett uses footnotes. I just think that it's wonderful. Um, speaking of footnotes, Susanna Clark, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And I want to plug her as well because she's got a new book out soon. It's called Piranesi and it is completely different to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, but it is amazing. <laughs> I think I've seen it around on Twitter. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's really beautiful. Is um, it huge? Like, um... no, it's really short. It's something like, it's, I, I read it in a day. It's like, oh, really? really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, that's a lot, yeah. <laughs> but ma many more, many more. <laughs> so, um, and Debbie said, um, is there any Japanese novels that you would recommend? Yes, absolutely. So you have to choose depending on how hardcore Japanophile you are. <laughs> if you are hardcore Japanophile, you must read The Tale of Genji. It is enormous. It's like this big. Um, wow. And it was written in the 11th century AD. We think it's the first novel that was ever written. It was written by a woman called Lady Murasaki. Um, and it is a tale about a young prince and the way that his life um, unfolds in the court. But it's incredible, like incredible poetry, incredible images. It would be the book that I took to a desert island because it is, it's enormous and you can get a lot <laughs> out of it on multiple readings. So it's really yeah. good. Um, if you are like less hardcore and less kind of devoted to the course. <laughs> <laughs> you are obviously um, devoted. I, I was devoted for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're just, if you're really interested but less devoted, a brilliant person to read is an author called Ryonosuke Akutagawa. And he's famous because he wrote Rashomon, as in the, the film in the 50s. Um, he writes short stories, but he is an amazing gothic writer. So they're all kind of like 
they're a bit weird and a bit scary and there's a fantastic one called the hell screen which is about a painter who is so egotistical and evil that he can't paint anything he hasn't seen and one day he wants to paint um, a woman burning alive in a carriage oh <laughs> Yeah. Well, that sounds amazing and terrible all at the same time. Yeah, but the, <laughs> kind of the joy of Akutagawa is that people always get their comeuppance in the end. So you you read it and you're like, yeah. Like it's very <laughs> satisfying. It's like it's like that moment that Viserys gets what's coming to him in Game of Thrones. You're like, Whoa. Yeah, yeah, just know um, that it's gonna happen. Or yeah. you, you really want it to happen. It's just yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Um so Akutagawa is amazing. And there's also um one, one of like the big pillars of Japanese fiction is a guy called Akinari Ueda and Ueda writes fairy tales but they're like again they're like gothic fairy tales and the gothic had been going for ages in Japan before we ever thought of it here because obviously they do all the good things first there <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but he writes incredibly beautiful gothic ghost stories and they're from the they're from the 18th century but they are really readable even today and you can, there's there are good english translations you can just get it you can get it from a bookshop you, hopefully you can get it from um some libraries so those three i would say so taylor genji lady murasaki which by the way means lady purple has there ever been a better name yeah oh lovely i love that <laughs> I <know. laughs> um Ryonosuke Okutagawa with his short stories and also um akinari ueda with fairy tales Thank you. That's really that's great. Thank you. Um, Debbie's also asked, could you tell us about being a, a Daiwa scholar? Sure. Um, so I think the scholarship has changed a little bit since I did it because it's always kind of um, evolving. But essentially the core of it is every year they send between about six and ten people out to Tokyo for 19 months. It's fully funded. Um, you go to a language school for a year. And this is necessary because um, people in Tokyo sometimes speak English. People outside of Tokyo absolutely don't. And why would they? Because <laughs> Japanese is an amazing language and they don't need anything else because Japan is a rich, rich, rich country. They don't need us. Um, so you you do really need it. And you can't. it's very difficult to function in Japan if you don't speak Japanese. <laughs> so you do that for a year. Then you go on homestay for a month. I you can go wherever you want so like like clever people all my friends went to the south to like tropical islands like Okinawa which is really beautiful and you can go scuba diving and stuff <laughs> like a moron I was like oh I'm gonna do some novel research so I went to Hokkaido which is the northernmost island and the climate is exactly the same as that of Scotland in <laughs> this was not a bright idea it is the most it's the southernmost point in the world where the sea freezes and wow. Yeah, <laughs> part of Pepper Harrow is set there in a very miserable prison, which I <laughs> live next to. <laughs> That's so cool, though, that you have uh, you, that you you know you've actually you can when when I read that I'll know that you actually went there and and saw that. So I think that makes it much more. I think when you when you read books, you can definitely tell. You know, some people have got absolutely fantastic imaginations, but also I think there's also an element of people telling you know that you've been it or seen it or something so oh yeah no I know I, I've been around this so it, a lot of it is set in a prison and I, I went around the prison I dragged unbeknownst to me the entire English society of the town I was living in <laughs> around this prison so there's 40 really bored Japanese people going around this prison and me taking notes being like this is amazing this is all really good material <laughs> And they're like, oh, can we go home now? <laughs> can we please dissuade the white girl from doing anything else? And I was like, no, we need to save for lunch here. <laughs> yeah, I was unbearable. So sorry, Hokkaido, but you've got a book out of it, okay? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and then the final six months of the scholarship are um, uh, work placement. So I taught at Waseda University. Cool. And was that teaching English? or? Um, I was teaching creative writing in English officially and then but because everyone was learning in their second language in Japanese sometimes yeah that must have been a real experience and I guess that helped you when you came back to to the UK to teach creative writing you do you do teach creative writing at Bath do, yeah. yeah it seemed dead easy here when I could do it all in English yeah 
<laughs> yes, it's like, oh yeah, it's just the doddle now. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> I can always say what I want to say. <laughs> Debbie says thank you very much for the questions and her interest in your book and the event is in connection with Japan so um, she appreciates your insights very much. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you some um, more questions about the book if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I loved Katsu the Clockwork Octopus and I have to say that I was quite distraught at the end of book one when mm. it's left a bit um, open isn't it to whether he has survived or not and I'm not going to say whether he has survived or not but I loved him he was just for a sort of a, a clockwork he was really real um he was <laughs> he yeah for a clockwork creature who wasn't real he felt really real and he had a real oh. relationship and he was yeah he, he did become very much I, when I was telling someone about you the other day I said she writes about clockwork octopuses and they said oh you're definitely your soul I'm sold <laughs> good stuff I'm pleased to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kate says, do you have any future plans for Katsu? I love Katsu. Oh, another Katsu fan. You will see if you recap the harrow. <laughs> I have um, requested today. We've got, um, we've got both of your, uh, we've got the Bedlam stacks and we have um, the Watchmaker on Borrow Box, which is our audio books um, platform and on our Libby platform, which is eBooks. Um, but I couldn't see a copy of um, Pepper Harrow on there yet, so I have asked our stock manager today if he can get some for us. So um, it's, very, it's very new out. It was only out on March the fifth, so it's so that was difficult for you. That was one of the questions I was going to say because we've had um, several authors on that have um, missed uh, sort of their tours. Did you have a tour planned for this one? I did, and um, on the day that lockdown was declared, I was supposed to be flying to the states. Oh no. So that got cancelled, but I did manage to go around England a little bit beforehand. Like I did do a few bits and bobs, so I was actually a lot luckier than most people. Yeah, some of the people have had them out. So you, yeah, you, so you had the beginning of March, so you were probably just just able to squeeze a few yeah. in before. Has it made a difference to the book? I can't tell. I can't tell. And I, I also feel like when a book comes out in hardback, there's there's a certain kind of person who buys a book in hardback and often yeah. they're buying it as a gift or maybe they have a very special relationship with books, but it's it's a lot of money to spend on one thing, isn't it? Like if that book is twelve ninety nine, that's that's like, you know, you have to think about that. And I tend to find with books that you don't really know what the readership is or what the sales are gonna be until the paperback's been out yeah. for a little while. Um, so with any luck, the paperback will be out early next year. That's good. Um, so we'll have we'll have a better idea of it then. But that also means it's so much more accessible to like you know normal people um, who who don't have the money to invest in this massive hardback. Um, so yeah, I don't know to what extent the events really influence sales. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to say, isn't it? Because somebody mm. might see you one day and then buy the book six months later and you can't necessarily link those two things. Um, but for, for writers, it's always a huge morale boost because obviously we spend a year locked away in our yeah. dining rooms writing the book, not seeing any other humans. So the tour is a way to kind of come out of your shell a bit and to, to actually have some, you know, human interaction, which is, which is really great. So I was very glad that I did get a few events in before it all shut down. It is nice. And I think... I've I think you're right with hardbacks they are definitely um from, from events that we've done at exeter um you know you do get a hardcore fans and i think probably because it's a sequel to a book that was so popular that definitely you know you would get people waiting for it to come out and and buy it in hardback um but i think it, it, like yeah. you said it's quite a lot of money and hopefully we can get some copy we will get some copies in the libraries as well so i think that's another way that people can access it and hardbacks are really popular in libraries still um yeah, I mean, they're much hardier. So they are really great for libraries because they can go through lots of hands yeah. and they don't completely disintegrate. Um, yes, but they are just... I, I wonder if sales have been hit a little bit because so many people are on furlough and if you're taking 80% of your pay, like, do you, do you really want to afford a hardback? Yeah. Um, so it's... I completely sympathize with people who are desperate to get books but just can't at the moment because of money concerns so I'm very very keen for you to get this into the library <laughs> no we will I'm on the case I'm definitely on the case yeah. and as I said we've got the others all the others are on either Libby or Borrow Box or both um watchmakers on both I, I listened to it which was really lovely I really enjoyed listening to it 
Yeah. Uh, has it been recorded um, as an audio book? Um, yeah, has, I think. I think it's Thomas Judd. Again, yeah. the same guy who does. Oh yeah, he's really good. I really liked him. Really I really, good. yeah. It does make such a difference with audio books. How oh, yeah. who reads them? Um, so um, we've got another question from Linda. Have Natasha's books been translated into any other languages? Yeah. Um, so Watchmaker has been translated into Spanish, Japanese, Russian, Danish. I think Swedish is coming soon. Um, Turkish. <laughs> weirdly. Wow. Um, <laughs> Do you get copies yeah. of all these books? Because I've seen that before where you get authors where they get a copy of each one. <laughs> They do. And actually, it's gone into so many that I had to ask my agent to stop sending me copies. because <laughs> My house is now full of books that I can't read. <laughs> well, we had um, Callie Taylor on and she kindly donated some to the library for our sort of foreign fiction. Um, but they've, they've got completely different titles as well. Does that happen with yours? They've got they're called something. And you, like, you sort of have to guess what they're called because obviously. So the, I think only the Dutch one has a different title i think they called it the watchmaker of london because in dutch i think filigree street didn't make any didn't sense work, yeah. i think everything else everything else went into sorry i've got the japanese one here somewhere and they did call it the watchmaker of filigree street i think we've got about lost it yeah <laughs> we've got about sort of six or seven minutes left did you want is that long enough for you to read a bit did you want to read a little bit from i Pat can Harris? read a little bit that's absolutely fine it I might look a bit strange when I'm doing it because I don't actually have a copy, so I'm just reading it off Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> is that all right? <laughs> yeah, and what we'll do is when we when we record this and put it on YouTube, I'll get um, Callum, who's our super, uh, su supervisor, to put a little, um, he'll impose one around somewhere so that you can see the co oh. cover. <laughs> That's lovely. Okay, well, I thought, because I only have it on Amazon, I'll, I'll just read the first few pages if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Okay, brilliant. Okay. So this is the prologue. It's easy to think that nobody could really arrange the world like clockwork. All sorts of things would get stuck in the mechanisms. History is full of queens and generals who've given it a damn good go but failed because of nothing more complicated than the weather. But clairvoyants have a knack for arranging time and it was not without a sense of irony that Kate and Maury was the watchmaker. In his workshop, it was difficult to see what he was making until it was done. A lot of organized chaos characterized the way he worked, so much so that he could be constructing something for months or years and it would only look like a tangle of something generically worrying, right up until it got up, walked off and turned out to be an octopus. It was even harder to tell what he was making when he was using time and not steel. But if you knew him quite well, it was possible to discern when he was arranging something and sometimes even sketch the shape of its tentacles. One tentacle began to take a clear shape to anyone watching closely enough on the last day of October in 1888 in St. Petersburg. Pyotr Kuznetsov was surprised when, after having not seen each other for five years, Maury sent him an invitation for coffee at the Hotel Angleterre. Hotel Bloody Angleterre, Piotr snarled at, snarled at nobody as he crossed the road, which startled a boy who'd been shoveling snow. On the great official map, Japan hated everyone. It was one of those deliciously rich but underdeveloped little countries that everyone wanted to invade, Britain, Russia, America. But Russia was closest, and so if there had to be a ranking, it was number one on Tokyo's to be stabbed list. Piotr and Mori shouldn't have been friends. Officers in enemy countries' secret police were expected not to be. But they'd always been exact counterparts throughout their service careers. They both existed with one foot in often unpleasant, boring business, the other at black tie events at embassies. They both disliked flag waving and Americans. Mori could drink properly and Piotr knew all the rules of sumo. They had a lot more in common with each other than with the flag waving ministers they worked for. One small spanner in the otherwise smooth works was that Maury was, and there was absolutely no getting around this, rich. He did horrible things, like invite Piotr to fancy hotels, as though any normal human would even get through the door at the Angleterre. Tolstoy was staying there now. Piotr had never lost an instinct of anxiety about places with gilded frescoes and resident novelists. Maury had retired from the Japanese service a few years ago, or so he said. 
he'd been living in a suite at the Angleterre for six months, making clockwork for the Tsarina. It was the most stupendous cover story Piotr had ever seen because Maury actually was making clockwork for the Tsarina. She'd given the Home Minister a watch a few months ago and he'd been showing it to everyone, including Piotr. It was gorgeous. Piotr was willing to be called Katerina for a year if Maury really was here for clockwork. He paused outside the hotel. It was still only 10 to 11. He'd left himself extra time in case the doorman wouldn't let him in. Decently, he'd wait, but it was so cold he couldn't stand still. The snow had flurried on and off for four days now, although the edges of the pavement had been shoveled up seven feet high. Like icing sugar, it was fine and dry, and the passing of every cab and carriage blew wisps of it glittering into the air. Just along, just along the road from the hotel, some men were repairing a telegraph line that must have snapped in the cold, and still only October. It was going to be a wolf of a winter. In fact, the doorman did let Piotr in. He didn't even have to show his Okrana badge. The cafe was, a busy, was busy, a singing clatter of cakes being delivered on three-tiered plates and women talking. You knew you were somewhere well-heeled when the men spoke more softly than the women. But he saw Maury straight away by the window because the spray of mechanical parts on the table caught the light. He was making a toy octopus. He was adjusting something in its insides, but the octopus was trying to steal the silver spoon from the sugar bowl. Is that alive? Piotr asked, mainly to avoid exclaiming that Maury didn't look one single bollocking day older than the last time they'd met up. Piotr had gone grey. No, said Maury in his courtly Russian. He had the most unexpected voice of anyone Piotr knew. He was a nymph of a man, but he sounded like petroleum fumes would if they'd had anything to say. Just pretending. That is all you're going to get. <laughs> That's all you're going to get. Well, thank you. I've got one more question to ask you just before. That was great. I really enjoyed that. And it's, it's nice to hear you read it, actually, especially with all the um, pronunciation. And um, I think when you read it, well, when you listen to it, it's really nice. I like being read to stories. So I think your, your books really do lend themselves to being listened to as well. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Kate says she's just finished reading all three books during lockdown. So lockdown <laughs> has had its benefits for Kate. Um, thank you for making self-isolation bearable. And she'd love to know if Merrick will appear in future books. Not in future books, but I have written a Bedlam short story, which I hope my <laughs> publisher will do something with soon. So hopefully, yes, hopefully he will reappear. Yeah. So hopefully, yes, Kate, that Merrick will hopefully appear somewhere. That'll be like the, um, the if you've seen the normal pe all the normal people things that have been, they, and that um, Sally Rooney wrote a short story and that sort of popped up. So uh, maybe it'll be like that. It'll just pop up one day when, yeah. when they, is there any, do you think there's any plans to turn it into a TV show or anything? Because I think it would make a great TV show, I think. So Watchmaker. Yeah. So a producer has bought the rights, but that doesn't mean that it'll go made. No. <laughs> um, so you it, you speak to a lot of writers and a, a lot of them have had the TV rights bought. Um, but I don't know anyone who's actually had it made apart from Jesse Burton. Yeah. So um, so I don't know. It would be, it would be an amazing pipe dream if, if it did get made. So the, the rights have been bought, which is step one. Oh, that's um, good. It's that's step good. one of many steps. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming along um, virtually this, this evening, Natasha, and, and we would love to invite you back to Exeter Library in real life when uh, book four is out next year, hopefully, or even oh, when, even when <laughs> or even when the paperback's out in in, uh, in the new year. Um, yeah, if, if, if we're allowed to, if we're allowed to have we're allowed to move, yeah. so nice. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for um, coming along this evening, and I hope um, that your all your fans and thank you for introducing me to the watchmaker because it, I had it was on my to be read list and I, I have shoved it quite because I knew I was going to be talking to you I did shove it up the list quite quickly <laughs> well, really, well I will be reading um Pepper Harrow now um and also the bedroom stack so thank you for introducing those to me um and thank you again for coming oh thank you so much for having me it's been lovely thank you Goodbye, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, we'll hopefully be having another event soon, um, so please keep an eye out on our Facebook page. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>